For the first time, we've put the hands of the engineers who have heretofore been the game designers. They've designed all the games we see in the arcades. Now we're taking Hollywood and the screenwriters and the people that work with dramatics and we're putting them hand in hand so that engineers and uh, dramatists, if you will, will now work on what will be in the arcade market. And that's why I think you'll find something that is tremendously more exciting, something that will pull you into the screen like you haven't been pulled before. These kids at the Celebrity Sports Center here in Denver are playing the newest rage in arcade games, Dragon's Lair. You've seen how different this game looks from the average video game. The reason is the players are actually playing a movie. Options are presented to the player on screen, and it's up to the player to react correctly. The scenario changes depending on the reactions and decisions the player makes. Make the wrong decision, and our hero, Dirk, meets an untimely end. It was invented in part by former Walt Disney animator Don Bluth, who has struck out on his own and in the last few years has been responsible for the animation in the motion picture Xanadu and for the artistic and critically acclaimed Secret of Nim. First of all, you have to give the illusion that the game player is in control, when indeed he may not be. But you must give that illusion. I thought, well, that's right up our alley. That's movie making. Give the illusion. Present a moment to him in which he must react a moment of danger, and then get him to react to that moment at the right moment, then you'll see another scene in which he is saved from that. I thought, well, that's very interesting. How can I design a game which will present enough of those moments in short little periods of time to where the game becomes exciting and gets him keyed up? And that was the challenge of designing the game. Dragon's Lair is as different from normal video games as Space Invaders was to pinball. There's absolutely no comparison. The task of putting the game together was awesome. Thirteen animators sketched 50,000 drawings of the characters in action. 24 drawings for each second on screen. The drawings were then transferred onto clear plastic sheets called cells and painted. Intricate detailed backgrounds were drawn and painted as well. Special effects like raging fire, crumbling walls and deadly vapor were added to signal immediate danger to the player. The cells were combined, and then each drawing was sent to the camera department for photographing, one frame at a time. 1,440 frames for each minute of finished product. Dialogue, sound effects, and a musical score were added to enhance the feeling of playing a movie instead of a game. Finally, the entire film was transferred to a high-resolution laser disc for use in the game itself. An incredibly complicated process. An incredible game. Dirk's task is to get through all the various dungeons and obstacles so he can ultimately save a damsel in distress from a terrible dragon. It's harder than it looks, and the game costs 50 cents per turn, although you are given five tries to make it to Dragonville. They call it participatory video entertainment, and it's expected to give a big boost to the already soaring arcade market, which brought in more than $9 billion last year. That's three times the amount of money made by the movie business. Dirk is sure to keep those quarters coming in. Unassuming as a modern-day David, his name is Rick Dyer, better known as the inventor of the laser video game Dragon's Lair. We went from zero to $30 million in orders in, in uh, the first 40 days. It's incredible. Dragon's Lair was originally intended as a home video game, but Dyer had no way of marketing his idea. No one knew what a laser was. Uh, they would imagine a, a James Bond movie with, that, uh, with a laser beam that cut someone in, in, in half. They didn't know what a laser disc player was. How far ahead of the video game industry Rick Dyer is can be seen in something that may end up in the Smithsonian Museum. It's the forerunner of Dragon's Lair. To show how fast the video game industry has changed, consider this, the first video game invented by Rick Dyer. It was developed in a garage in Pomona way back in 1979. This was Dyer's first computerized interactive game. It used cash register paper, a good omen of things to come. Computer would, like, kind of like a, a player piano, it would, it would roll the paper forward at a high speed and then stop, and you'd see a picture and some writing, and it would give you a list of choices. From that, he developed a computerized film strip game, then added sound. 
It all led to Dragon's Lair, that even with a technical blackout flaw, revolutionized the young industry. Now Dyer is ready with Space Ace. The scripts and storyboard are done locally. The animation is by former Disney artist Don Bluth. This working video copy shows the sketches along with the finished layout. Come on, use the aqua boots. Ah! Space Ace has one sequence that could be symbolic in Dyer going head to head with Atari. The giant is shown destroying himself in pursuit of the smarter and quicker hero. I think right now the arcade industry is playing catch up to us. I know what, uh, what's coming after our, uh, the introduction of our home system. We have a sense of direction here, which is, uh, I'm not sure that, that some, of, some of the companies like Atari have that anymore. Tomorrow, something from Rick Dyer so secret we can't reveal its name. It won't be released until June, but you'll have the first public look in our final report. What you're seeing could be the world's most unusual movie. It's a movie that allows the viewer to decide what happens from moment to moment. Dragon's Lair is a new generation video game, and it's as far removed from Pac-Man as Steamboat Willie is from Sleeping Beauty. The electronics of the game are the creation of Rick Dyer, and the animation is the work of Don Bluth Studios of Los Angeles. Don Bluth was formerly an animator for Walt Disney Studios, but in 1979, he and 11 other Disney animators walked out and formed their own company. Their first major project, The Secret of Nim, was considered to be visually beautiful by critics, but didn't raise too much fire at the box office. We put the, the film in the theaters, The Secret of Nim, and it had a so-so response, and I figured out last summer that everybody was watching E.T. So, and if they weren't watching E.T., they were in the arcades playing games. And right after the picture had been released and we saw that, you know, probably wasn't going to get immediately out of the red, so we better be thinking of something else that will help animation to grow. And there was a, at that time, uh, there was a young man who came to us and he says, our company called Advanced Microcomputers would like to do an arcade laser disc game. I thought, fantastic. And then I learned some figures about the arcade. Basically, they had about $9 billion last year, which is three times the movie industry. I said, that's where the audience is. They're in the arcades. Awesome. So, yeah, so <laughs> I, wh why couldn't we do this then? We could make a animation game and with a laser disc, you don't have to settle for the little sticks and dots. You can actually put full-blown, full-length animation on that screen. So with that kind of an idea in mind, we started working on game concept. How do you get the laser light to relocate on the disc so that it plays the scenes in the right order? That's where I'm lost. Or I don't know how that thing works. <laughs> well, I didn't either until someone explained it to me. It's like a phonograph record that you can just simply spot it at any place you want on the disc, unlike a tape that you have to hunt for a place on the disc. So it's called random access when they get into the, you know, the jargon of the engineers. But that laser light will access itself to any point on the disc, so all we have to do is design a scene showing danger and then put another scene next to it showing the resolve of that danger. And if the player is reacting correctly when he sees the dangers, he'll either push a directional stick or push a sword button, and the laser disc will relocate to the next scene. That'll probably change the uh, whole video game look, won't it? That's what I think is going to happen, the whole thing. In fact, the arcades right now are showing a tremendous enthusiasm for Dragon's Lair, which is a beautiful visual. It's a quantum leap forward with visuals. So what I believe will happen now is you'll see all the rest of the great big arcade production companies who design games, they'll have to get into the visual business. Sure. That pulls Hollywood into the picture. You know, we can't settle for sticks and dots anymore. We're going to have to have script writers and scores. And when Dragon's there, we had a musical score. When we have uh, sound effects and you have a little story, you have main characters and a villain and you know all the things that we traditionally see in we films. Also have the, the, uh, the lady. Ah, yes. What is the world without the lady? So Save me. <laughs> that's what she says. So anyway, we've created what I think is basically a mini movie. It's done with a laser disc. It's in the arcade. And you have to interact with it using controls to see the, the, the story play itself out.
Dragon's Lair is a phenomenon in the video arcades, even though Dragon's Lair is a tough place to try to stay alive. Unlike a cat, our hero Dirk the Daring has only three lives. That is, unless you have another quarter. I'm very excited about Dragon's Lair and the visual games, these arcade games, because it will help us train animation talent. Because you can experiment and try new things, you can put visual things on there that aren't really, you know, lack of feature. And by exploring new talent and by being able to fund it, because, gee, the money involved is tremendous, then we can then put those animators over under the features, because we still have a couple of features right back there that we're getting ready to start on, too. I wanted to ask you, man, you do have somebody working on it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Wasn't NIM supposed to be a continuation? Uh, like a sequel yeah. to NIM? Well, I'm hoping that someday we, we could do that. I'd like to explore what happened in The Secret of NIM, you know, where the rats went and how they got along and... Did they eventually do in the human race or what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful. That's one thing that I remember also about your company is that you wanted to bring back the, the good-looking animation, which everybody got away from because of cost and everything else. And NIM's a perfect example. I mean, it's a beautifully done picture. Well, I'm very proud of NIM, very proud, because I think it did prove that classical animation can be done in today's economy. And so many people were saying that it can't, you know, that that kind of thing is gone. There was a golden age, and it's all over. Uh, and I don't believe that's really true. I think if you want it to happen, you can make it happen. So Secret of Nim definitely proved that. Not only is the picture radically different, so is the sound, which is capable of very high fidelity, because neither picture nor sound is computer generated. <laughs> Rather, they are recorded on a high-technology laser beam version of a video disc player. And that player enables you to take a 30-minute roll of film, put it on a disc, and you can cut from any one scene or frame to another almost instantaneously. Rick Dyer's company has married computer technology to Hollywood. The artist works from a complete story script using the same animation procedures that produced Mickey Mouse and Snow White. But these adventures are vastly more complicated because every scene must have two or more alternative conclusions, each flowing pictorially from the preceding action. In this tunnel, the hero has the chance to escape through a hole in the wall or to reach for that chain. If he misses, he slides to doom. On the other hand, if he does reach the chain, look out. Dragon's Lair, a fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. This is Dragon's Lair, different from any other game in that it uses live action animation. You literally play in your own cartoon. The creator is Don Bluth, who once directed several Disney features in the mid 1970s. Last year, Bluth found his own audience with his first animated feature, The Secret of Nim. It was he and a company called Advanced Microcomputer Systems that invented the game. Dragon's Lair is the first video interactive arcade game in which a player has to watch it like he would a movie. And as he's watching this movie, about every second or half a second, he has to interact with the controls to keep the movie going. The game uses a high-resolution laser disc, which, when combined with a computer, lets a player direct the hero through several obstacles in order to save a princess. The picture is about 120 times better than any other game, and that has arcade orders pouring in. The familiar din of the video arcade is fading out. Business has dropped in half over the past year, and companies like Atari claim losses of more than $350 million. The slick, swift-paced space games are taking a nosedive, and analysts predict a crunch in the industry by Christmas. The craze has definitely peaked. But there is something completely different that's invading the video emporium these days, and it's a result of the recent marriage between the laser and computer technology. It's pretty amazing to see, so if your game, let's coin up. Enter the world of the Dragon's Lair. It's big news at most arcades these days because of its unique action. The screen transforms into another dimension, and the player controls the fate of a real character whose quest is to slay the dragon. It's too hard. Oh, I think it's about the best game I've ever played. It took me at least 40 dollars before, you know, I killed the dragon. And... 
One thing about these new games, they're a bit more expensive than the regular arcade games. These cost 50 cents to play, and Dave here is going to stand behind me and help me in case I make a mistake. Okay. The player is responsible for the safety of Dirk, the hero of the story. Now, it's Dirk's mission to kill the dragon and save the princess. But first, he must face a series of fatal obstacles. Like any good cartoon, Dirk is up against every imaginable peril. Only here, in order to win, you must make all the right choices to get him to his happy end. And take it from me, it's not easy, but a real challenge to both adults and kids. This makes you want to save the lady, you know. It's pretty much fun. I like it a lot. You don't know what's going to happen next. It'll make you jump if you do something wrong. It's like, you know, exciting. The idea of turning cartoons into video games was developed at Rick Dyer Industries. We're in the entertainment business, and no one had really come out with anything new, some, a, a new novelty, something, and people were sick of, of computer graphic games. It didn't have appeal. They're tired of it. They wanted something a little more real. Some new games are being formulated at Dyer's plant. The process is exactly the same for any full-length animated movie, with every picture and background carefully hand-drawn and painted by the staff of graphic artists. The storyboard usually includes over 600 shots. Approach. Come and meet the Sorceress of Gaul. In the future, Laserdisc games will feature real voices to enhance the texture and add a more human quality to the experience. I have no love for that egotistical fool who thinks he's the only one skilled with magic. What I'm going to do is to create a world that is so real and that you will, will have a hard time telling what's real and what isn't. Using laser technology of the 80s has enabled the engineers to make a pretty amusing game. And now other companies are jumping on the train. But it'll be the public who judges their success. What they want is a variety. We constantly get tired of one type of food or one type of movie or one type of game. And so as you progress, you want to go on to a new thing. 